Today, we're going to hear from Ray McCormick and Rob Myers. So um, take it away, Ray. <laughs> All right, thank you. And first off, I'd like to thank all the sponsors of this. Uh, I've worked with many of them in the past. I've worked with the Walton Foundation to do a film called Roots of Conservation. So some of you may have seen that, but without these partnerships, it's hard to advance conservation. So first off, I'd like to thank the sponsors and the Midwest Cover Crop Council for putting this on. Uh, ever since I was a little boy, I was in love with wildlife and, uh, you know, like so many people I know that are big in conservation and do lots of things now that have a big impact, we all started out with a love for wildlife. So uh, my entire life, I've been trying to get as much wildlife on my land as, as possible. And in June of 1986, I planted my first no-till into cover crops. And ever since, I've literally spent hours walking, hunting, but mostly riding in equipment, looking at the wildlife out the window and trying to envision how I can do more for wildlife and be a part of great habitat and a great ecosystem while cover also webinar on making my land cover crops. So cover crops have a great wide range of impacts on birds and, and uh, midwestbirds, uh, mammals, songbirds, raptors, amphibians, pollinators. Uh, what's good for in, invertebrates is good for all of the food chain. So that's one thing that I try to focus on is that not only what I see on top of the soil, but what's going on under the soil has a big impact on uh, the ability to wildlife to thrive in my fields and in my fence rows and wetlands and woods and so forth. And of course, when you look underground, we look at the biology there and there's, there's enough organisms in the palm of your hand uh, of a, a healthy soil it would be outnumber the number of human beings that's been on the earth in the entire history. So it's this diverse world uh, that's just under the soil that we're just starting to appreciate and understand. And of course, uh, earthworms are a big part of that. Uh, earthworms, uh, just a lot, with a lot of the biology, break up the compaction, build soil health, and actually do a lot of depositing of their. Uh, waste in the ground that can add a lot of nitrogen to the ground and so forth. So when we think about what's underground, it's the equivalent on every acre of having two elephants. So what I do on my farm is try to feed those two elephants, all those organisms that are just under the surface of the soil. And in return, they help me. But having ground cover, having cover crops is critical, not only to insects, but all of the ecosystem. Invertebrates play a key role in, in the food chain. So when I hop off of my tractor and I get down, let's, or off the combine, because at my age, you got to get off and take a, a bathroom break. But you look down at the soil, you kneel down, and you can see a lot of the insects, spiders, mites, beetles, all of this thriving uh, world that exist in a healthy soil, in a healthy environment, and in a healthy field. Uh, insects provide a great benefit to all of us from pollination and predators and nutrients cycling. So a big part of what happens under the ground is nutrient cycling. So we don't add fertilizer to grow crops. We add fertilizer to build biological life under the soil and they feed the roots of my crops. So without that interaction, interaction with the soil biology, with the insects and the whole ecosystem of the soil, uh, we can't grow anything. So spiders are a part of that, but predators are a big part of it. So by having years of healthy soil and limiting the use of insecticide, I've been able to transition into not using insecticide. So when I plant corn and soybeans, I don't use neonicotinoids on the seed. I plant what I call naked seed. So the corn that I plant doesn't have fungicides on it. It doesn't have insecticides on it. With these healthy predator insect populations, a 
a non-friendly insect like a cutworm would lay an egg, uh, that egg or that emerging cutworm doesn't have a chance when you have healthy insect populations. So I'm not only able to uh, not use insecticides, but I'm also able to cut my cost in uh, growing crops by having healthy soils that convert nutrients, but also populations. And of course, healthy insect populations are just part of the food chain because birds feed on them and bats feed on them. And, and so having healthy insects out there and a lot of insects is actually a very positive thing on my land. You know, when I plant cover crops and select cover crops, I like to get some that flower. And here are some examples of flowering cover crops. So when you use cover crops, diversity is key, but also allowing them to mature. So as, as uh, different cover crops begin to mature, they create a great amount of biomass. And that biomass, that, that tonnage of, of uh growth that's on top of the soil on every acre, it melts down into the ground by the use of all this soil biology. So the earthworms come to the surface and grab it. Uh, the biology begins to chew up the carbon and use it up. So carbon sequestration and, and not tilling the soil and having pollinator plants is all a part of solving so many of the issues that we have out there on the land. And of course, just in Indiana, we have over 14 million acres of tillable land. So I always tell people, if you want to make a big impact, you work with farmers, you work with cover crops, you work with all of these tools that allow us to mimic nature and grow healthier, not just healthier corn and healthier beans, but it's healthier food. So the food we eat is not nearly as nutritious as it was 50 and 100 years ago because of the degradation of soil. So wildlife actually plays a key role in building our soils and enable us so that the cereal you eat or the sweet corn you eat or all the things that we might feed our children are much healthier than they once were. And of course, spraying insecticides sets that all back. We also can create nectar and pollen. And so for emerging insects, and I see this, is we have insects that emerge early in the spring and they're in my pollinator garden and along my uh, streams where I have conservation buffers, but there's other insects that come out later in the spring. So again, diversity, not only in the field with your cover crops, but in the habitat along the roads, along the streams, all play a combination. And it provides habitat where many of these beneficial insects like bees and other things can lay their eggs and, trans and successfully reproduce. So having plants and flowers out there that can provide uh, habitat for egg laying is a big part of it also. And so here we're looking at a field without cover crops. And then in the bottom slide, you can see one and there are probably no till fields from looking at them, but the one on the left has cover crops on the one on the right does not. On my field, it wouldn't look like this because mine would be thicker and more diverse. You would see all kinds of different plants and that diversity is one of the keys to building soil health. So when we farm just corn or corn and soybeans, we're really starving the soil and starving the ecosystem. So by using cover crops, especially here in the Southern Corn Belt where they're green up until January and green now, it actually gives you a bridge through a lot of the year where a lot of wildlife, a lot of insects, a lot of diversity can thrive in your fields, even though no-till has a great function in not releasing carbon into the atmosphere, but cover crops plays a far greater role. So you really accelerate uh, the ability to grow successfully and to build the soil. This is not about sustainability. This is about building. We have highly degraded soils and environments. So using cover crops, we have a chance to build back our soils. So those of us that are big into the soil health movements don't even like the word sustainability because where we're at now isn't good enough. We can do better and we will do better 
by using these techniques that I'm talking about, a less insecticide use, but also building our landscapes with cover crops. And of course, Indiana is a leader in cover crops, one and a half million acres of cover crops, but that's not good enough. We have to do better. We have to get more people using cover crops and conservation organizations and partnerships are how we do that. And as you see the, the figure there, row crop agriculture over 250 million acres. Another thing that I'm always passionate about is bird populations out on the ground. I used to be a regional director for Quell Unlimited, so I became very aware of the diverse habitats that it takes for, for pheasants and songbirds and quail to succeed. But I also have a lot of river bottoms and a lot of wetlands, so I focus a lot not only on these game bird populations and songbird populations that I see frequently around these landscapes, but I'm also very interested in migratory bird populations. So when you have a healthy soil, you'll have a lot of wading birds. You'll have a lot of shore birds that migrate through. You'll see them probing the ground. And I don't know there's ever been a study, but when you're building a healthy soil, I believe that those wading birds are utilizing my land and utilizing these flooded areas and these pools of water because the soil is rich with wildlife, it's rich with all the invertebrates and so forth they're probing for. And, and these migratory birds, you know, a lot of them start off in South America and are migrating all the way to the Arctic. So you can imagine when they, when they stop by these and stop in on these Midwestern habitats, uh, they've got to refuel in a hurry. They make half the trip without landing. So when they land here, they need healthy soils. They need lots of insects. They need uh, lots of things that can fatten them back up in a hurry so they can get on their way to the Arctic to, to nest. So in the Midwest, we have the opportunity to use cover crops, not only for the birds that live here and nest here, but we have an opportunity to make a big impact on migratory birds. A, a lot of the migratory birds we see in this area have 10% of the populations they had just a few de decades ago, just 10%. There's also habitat that you develop by growing cover crops. So we can see in the top photo there, there's a nest in cover crops. So as I'm planting, I get to observe. And when I'm planting, I'm usually planting into green. So planting green means that I've let the cover crop grow as long as possible and I did not terminate it, usually a couple of days before or a few days after planting. So I get to see, you know, and monitor and, and, and really survey the bird populations out there. So, you know, you see a lot of birds in these fields and you see meadowlarks. And, and when you step out of the tractor, stand at the side of these fields, you can actually hear them out in the field. So, you know, yeah, we're planting through them, but in my case, I don't use a row cleaner. I try to use, make as least disturbance as possible. So it's hard to see when I'm planting corn, I plant 24 rows at a time. So there's not a lot of wheel traffic and a great percentage of the ground does not get disturbed. How much nest and how much they utilize those nests after I planted, I don't know. But surely they would rather be out on ground with cover crops where they have a chance that their nests aren't going to be destroyed, or they have these vast prairies of cover crop that allows them to try to re-nest. And, and the meadowlark is one of them that's in trouble. You know, we don't have expanses of grassland now, but we can have if we use cover crops. And of course, brood rearing habitat. One of the things I learned when I was working so much on Bob White quail is they have to be able to see the ground. So Bob White quail won't, won't scratch at the ground to uncover seeds or insects. They got to be able to see the ground. So here you see a small chick uh, wandering through some soybeans and cover crop in there. The first six weeks of a Bob White quail's 
life. That chick feeds only on insects. So if we destroy that insect population, if we spray insecticides across these fields and they drift into the fence row and so forth, now these small chicks can't survive. They need the protein of live insects. So I believe that you know, by having healthy soils, having cover crops and having good habitat along the border helps with all of the habitats that are needed to uh, produce quail and all kinds of birds. Uh, quail need not only nesting habitat, they need brood rearing habitat, they need escape habitat, they need food and, and, and of course no-till and cover crops can actually uh, provide food. So uh, seeds and stock uh, insects populations are critical to these brood rearing periods of thought. And so on a lot of my ground, my landlords and I and people that want to lease the ground, you know, they all want to grow a food plot. It costs $25 for a small bag of seed to put out there. Well, I just plant a food plot on every acre. So every acre that I farm has cover crop on it. And a lot of times that's clovers, uh, that's turnips, that's radishes. It just is a wide diversity of cover crops that I use. So for my landlords, I say, I'm not going to put out a food plot. I'm going to plant every acre for you. So you see a lot of deer on my neighbor's farm just over the hill here. I think a lot of the deer from the surrounding area come and spend the winter here because for miles around, I'm sort of the oasis for wintertime food supplies. And if you want to grow a big rack, which a lot of people do because their families hunt and so forth, you have to have good nutrition in the spring. The nutrition of the dough is the single biggest factor in determining the size of a rack on a buck for his lifetime. So there's another example of having healthy habitats can also have healthy deer populations. And people say, well, I have too many deer. Well, you don't have enough deer hunters. And so uh, we really enjoy seeing the deer populations on our ground. And I enjoy being able to see them out in my fields in the wintertime. And everybody comes and drives by to see them. And, and they're just part of the ecosystem now. So food and cover for voles, rabbits, and fur bears for all kinds of wildlife can be provided with cover crops. And that gives me a great deal of, of satisfaction. You know, I used to say, I'm not buying any piece of ground that doesn't have a covey of quail on it. Well, one of the things that brings you joy in life is seeing wildlife on your own farm. It is truly a build it and they will come. And that is one of the most satisfying things you can see as a landowner. And of course, a lot of people now have cameras. We use them for trespassing because we have a lot of it because we have a lot of wildlife, but you also get to see all the critters out there at night. You see bobcats. We actually captured a mountain lion on a, on a camera going through one of my farms along the Wabash River. And, you know, that's one of the probably most gratifying things that I've ever uh, uh, seen is a mountain lion uh, traveling through the woodland corridor on one of my farms, but also seeing rare and endangered species on my farm. We have uh, in two areas where whooping cranes uh, utilize uh, shallow water areas where I impound water out on the land where we have cover crops, but it's wide open areas and we create shallow water habitat there in the migratory bird season. So having two pair of these five foot white birds out on your land, some of the most endangered birds in the world is, is incredibly gratifying. And that diversity of habitat planting into something like this that's green and standing up, it, it provides fawning habitat and bedding habitat for deer, but it also provides habitat for rabbits and all kinds of wildlife. And, you know, sometimes as you get north of here, where we don't grow double crop beans, a lot of people plant great diversities of cover crop after wheat to build their soils up, and they actually get enough nitrogen out of that from growing a diversity of mixes after wheat harvest that they cut drastically back on their nitrogen needs. And of course, nitrogen is, is through the roof this year and a major 
contributor to greenhouse gases. You know, there's a diversity of things that we don't understand and we don't really study, but we should. So frogs and snakes and all kinds of critters that we see out there, we just don't even know the positive impact that we're making, but we know with habitat, they will come. So I'm hoping we spend more time and money. I was just with Ducks Unlimited last week at the Wetland Task Force meeting, and they said they're shifting gears and going to put major emphasis on cover crops and building healthy landscapes versus just concentrating on protecting wild wetlands. And of course, raptors play a good part of it. Bowls can be very damaging to your crops. So having uh, healthy raptor populations is good and by providing habitat. Now here you see fence rows along the field, but you know, raptors like barn owls and, and, and hawks and so forth have to have a place to perch so they can swoop down and get those bowls and different uh, wildlife on the land. So I try to leave trees in the corners of fields. Uh, some of my neighbors actually put perches out in the fields in the wintertime so they can perch on them. But certainly seeing a diversity of raptors in the field as, as they migrate through and, and you're running rabbits out of the soybeans and it's a chase to the fence row. Uh, all of that is part of the life cycle of, of raptors and predators and game and, and uh, you know, I'm just proud to be a part of that. And lots of farmers, if you go to the National No-Till Conference, you get a thousand farmers that farm like I do. And it really gives you hope and encouragement. And of course, uh, coyotes play a very beneficial role because coyotes get the voles. So I don't mind having voles out there as long as people leave the coyotes alone and they're able to dig them up and capture them. And they also have a right to have a part of our landscapes. And foxes are very, are getting more and more rare. I was just talking with a big farmer yesterday and I said, when's the last time you saw a gray fox. And he says, boy, it's been a long time since I've seen one. And he knows what he's talking about. You know, he knows wildlife. And so maybe we can help bring some species back like, you know, like foxes that are getting pretty rare these days. So by providing uh, all kinds of from insects to small birds to voles and so forth, we'll see more foxes in our neighborhood, once very common to see in our landscapes. This is a, an example when I say a diverse mix. So I grow these very things. You can see crimson clover, that's the red clover there. So often we will let our crimson clover go to bloom. The reason we do that is you're creating the most biomass possible, but also uh, the crimson clover and the vetch that you see there are legumes. So on the surface of the soil, this tremendous amount of biomass has a lot of nitrogen. And as the soil breaks down that plant material after you've killed it, it produces nitrogen. So late in the growing season, when corn has its greatest demand for nitrogen in the reproductive stage, you're actually feeding that nitrogen. You can cut back on nitrogen use and feed that nitrogen to the corn when it's most needed by utilizing the nitrogen that comes free from the air and putting that into the soil with the use of the biological life on the soil. The nitrogen is not underground. It produces modules underground that help sequester nitrogen out of the atmosphere. But in fact, most of the nitrogen, if not all of the nitrogen is in the biomass on top of the soil. So that biomass isn't readily available. But also I wanna talk about as we grow green like this for most of the year, instead of growing corn or soybeans for a third of the year, we have the opportunity in a massive way to put carbon dioxide. Uh, you know, if we wanna talk about wildlife, wildlife can't survive climate change or many kinds of wildlife are not gonna survive climate change and, and to make as impact, big an impact on climate change as we can, we need to use these millions upon millions of acres 
with diverse mixes of cover crop. So working the soil busts carbon into the air. So one of the leading contributors of carbon dioxide is the soil organic carbon that comes out of the soil with tillage. By never tilling, which I'm a never tiller, and growing cover crops and growing diversity and sequestering carbon, it's our only chance by creating the soil carbon sponge. It's our really our only chance to keep from going by the tipping point. The carbon dioxide is already in the atmosphere in massive levels. By using the energy of the sun and photosynthesis and cover crops, we can capture that carbon dioxide and grow more food, grow more wildlife habitat, grow more fiber and fuel. So really, our survival on this planet is tied to the use of cover crops. And there's an example of where you're planting green. In this case, he's uh, crimping down the cover crop. I don't do that. I leave mine standing. But they're showing here 70 to 90 percent of, of a nest are destroyed with no-till cover crop, but any tillage destroys 100% of the nest and destroys 100% of the insects. And a lot of the soil fertility is lost. A lot of soil erodes and takes phosphorus and, and when supercharged with the nitrogen off of our fields creates a massive uh, hypoxia zones, not only in the Gulf of Mexico, but it also does it in the drinking water of Indianapolis and the Great Lakes and so forth. So. No farmer wants to lose his nitrogen off into the rivers and damage the ecosystem and the wildlife in these rivers. So it's education, it's communication, it's all of these partnerships, but certainly the partnership with Midwest Cover Crop Council plays a vital role in getting more and more farmers to adapt to these tools. Uh, one of the things that I do on my farm is I try to utilize every acre and and so my grass waterways or my conservation buffers along streams are all co uh, committed to the best wildlife habitat that I can possibly grow. So I have native prairie grass and flowers along every stream that I farm. Those are conservation buffers along streams. Those are available for continuous sign up under USDA programs. USDA programs are the single biggest conservation funding program in the world. So the USDA, the Farm Bill, which will be renewed next year, we've got to work as hard as we can to get as much of these practices on the land as possible. So, you know, it can be a grass waterway when I, and it can be roadside. So, so many roadsides are mowed down by big mowers now and everything. I use a technique which I put a sprayer with two separate tanks on it on the back of my four wheeler. So I kind of run and gun. So if there's Johnson grass or invasive species, I might use a grass herbicide on one and a broadleaf herbicide on the other. But when there's milkweeds or when there's all these diverse uh, pollinators along the roadside, I only kill out the invasives. And when I go up and down through my grass waterways, I'm looking for invasives. And, you know, I don't care what the neighbors think to see all of the pollinator habitat and all of the wildlife in those grass waterways or in those conservation buffers. Uh, that's what's most important to me, not what the th neighbors think because I don't mow. And of course, this is what you can have if you work hard at it. We plant specifically under the CSP program on my farm, we plant pollinator habitat. I had to relocate a levee two summers ago that was falling into the stream and uh, we moved it back a hundred foot and planted the entire levee system in pollinators. So again, I'll run and gun that. I'll shoot Johnson grass and, and I'll maybe get invasive thistles or other invasives out of there. But I planted the whole levee in pollinator habitat. So these are the kind of techniques that other farmers can adapt and others 
that are stewards of the land from drainage boards to engineers to home builders and so forth. Can, it's not just on farmland. A lot of people can work to do these uh, buffers and odd areas in critical habitat. You know, it's nice to do it in your garden, but we can have a much bigger impact by doing it over large landscapes. And this is what I'm talking about as landscapes. You have the opportunity to no-till, have cover crops, use less chemicals, use less fertilizer, leave buffers. You know, a lot of our native bees are in trouble. So I'm not talking honeybees here. I'm talking about our native bee populations. There's over 400 in the state of Indiana. Uh, you have to care about them. We're dependent on them and they're key to the cycle of life as is many uh, parts of our ecosystem that we probably know little or, or nothing about as farmers. So thanks for the opportunity to speak with you today. And I doubt if we have time for questions because I am pretty winded when I'm talking about wildlife, but thank you Midwest Cover Crops Council for allowing me the opportunity to, to make an impact. Well, uh, I am Rob Myers and uh, very happy to visit with you today about um, kind of a related topic, which is when we look at the diversity that cover crops can support in the landscape, um, mostly we think about all the beneficial things and Ray did a great job talking about many of those. Uh, but inevitably the questions come up, well, what about the pest? And I well remember being in a uh, meeting with some extension agronomists in Missouri from all over the state. This is probably about six years ago. And uh, I gave a short overview talk about cover crops and immediately somebody raised their hand and said, well, what about, what I hear about the, these voles and slugs? Aren't they a big problem with cover crops? So uh, we do hear a lot about voles and slugs. We hear about other pests. The first thing I want to tell you, and if you remember nothing else about my presentation, just remember that although voles and slugs can indeed be serious problems on some fields, that when we look at the entire landscape of cover crop in the United States, and we're you know, over 20 million acres now, um, it's a relatively small proportion of the fields that have a serious problem in any given time. So. Uh, there may be a field in one year that will have a bad bull population or a bad slug issue. Um, they can be pretty localized. We tend to see a little bit more with slugs in the eastern corn belt, although they can occur in other areas, kind of depends on how cool and wet the year is. Bulls can also be highly regionalized, as can other pests. And so I don't want to diminish uh, the potential threat that some of these pose, but the good news is they're, they're only occasionally a problem. So having said that though, we do need to deal with them occasionally. Uh, Ray made a very a set of very good points about the benefits of not doing tillage. And I am certainly an advocate of not doing tillage as well. Uh, but we do know there are some farmers that use cover crops that are still using tillage. Maybe they're vegetable farmers or for other reasons they're using tillage. If you do have some tillage in as part of the system, it's less likely that you're gonna see uh, problems with or slugs. Now you may have other pest issues that show up, uh, but just that's part of what we think about this. So if we are in a situation with a no-till or reduced tillage, uh, then we need to think a little bit more about prevention and control. Uh, and so we'll go through some of that today. Now, the first thing when we talk about voles, and I'll start with them and then move into some slug issues and other pests, is just to know a little bit about vole biology. Um, these are small mammals, obviously a little bit bigger than mice. Um, I have them on my property here occasionally in Missouri, and uh, they can definitely boom very rapidly in population. Uh, there's really two types that we see uh, most commonly in the Midwest, although there's several species in the U.S. as a whole. But in the Midwest, we're most often going to see prairie voles, and they are ones that will tunnel down into the ground a little ways. Uh, and then meadow voles, which tend to build their runs right at the surface. So they will they like areas with lots of residue, both of them do. And the meadow voles will just kind of tunnel right underneath that residue, kind of build a runway. Both of these uh, species have a diet that's primarily green vegetation that will eat some seeds, depending on what's available to them, uh, especially when there's not green vegetation. 
As far as cover crops, they're going to prefer to eat clovers and vetches. Uh, meadow voles in particular will also eat grasses, and both of them can, but the meadow voles in particular are a little more likely to eat uh, grasses as part of their diet. So one key thing about voles, and it's not unlike field mice and some of our other small mammals, is they, they reproduce very rapidly. It doesn't take them long to reach sexual maturity. They can get to that point by a month old. It takes them only a few weeks to gestate young and several young at a time. So multiple generations in a year. So the populations can build rapidly. The good news is that they tend not to build up populations every year. Um, it may be every second or third year. In some cases, it may be once every four or five years, depending on the location, weather conditions, uh, populations of predators and so on. So they're gonna cycle up and down. Now that's good from the standpoint, they're not a problem every year, but it also makes control a bit perplexing because you think, oh, I had a lot of voles last year. I'm gonna go out and try to control them. Well, then you don't have maybe, maybe a very many of them next year. So it's hard to know what's working with control. What we're going to see with damage typically with voles is a patchy issue. There's the patterns of patchiness vary quite a bit. This is just one example of Barry Fisher caught in a field in Indiana. And, and by the way, I want to credit uh, Joe LaRose, a member of my staff, for putting together these slides. Barry Fisher contributed really great information. Um, Ray McCormick was also helpful, Jim Horman. Um, so appreciated the feedback. Uh, John Tooker was another one who provided some feedback on these slides. So as we look at uh, problems um, in no-till, uh, first of all, voles can show up in a field that doesn't have cover crops. They can be a problem in a no-till field. So it's really more of a residue issue and what kind of food source do they have? Now, cover crops do provide additional cover and food. So they certainly like a cover crop field. Uh, and if, they're, if the cash crop seed or corn and soybeans is not planted deeply enough, they'll tunnel down and get that seed. So that can be an issue. More often, the problem is that they're eating the tops of the seedlings as they're emerging. Now, the corn may be able to tolerate that as long as they don't eat the growing point. But with soybeans, that's a big issue. And that's why they tend to be somewhat worse of an issue for soybean fields than for corn fields. They're typically doing their foraging at night. Uh, this was a wildlife camera we set up here in Missouri that caught one uh, out doing some feeding. Uh, depending on the species you have, they may be coming out of grassy areas on the edge of the fields, uh, or if the field had been planted that was previously in pasture or CRP or hay ground, that can also contribute to the problem. So I want to look briefly at three different approaches to dealing with the voles. Uh, so our cash crop, then looking at our adjustments to cover crop and, and predators. So with our cash crop, if we can make sure we're getting that seed cot clot um, slot closed, that can really help. Um, if we drill the cash crop, that can be beneficial like with soybeans. Now, obviously, we're not going to do that with corn. But what's happening mainly is that that drill is going to kill a certain number of the voles uh, with its running over the field with the narrow row spacing. Sometimes if we plant deeper, that can help uh, reduce damage. And we can run a rotary hoe over the field. The fluffing the residue may disturb the runs, may kill a few of the voles. So those are a few things we can do. They're not going to solve the problem, but they can reduce the problem. As far as the cover crop itself, uh, we can look at things like what we're planting. So uh, if we have a really thick layer of just 100% vetch or clover, that may be the worst case scenario for voles. They really like those situations. If we can put some brassicas in there like radishes, they don't like the brassicas very much. They don't tend to eat those. So that can discourage them somewhat. Again, it's not a perfect solution, but it can help. And then if we can reduce the spring cover. Now, um, obviously, from a soil health standpoint, we like more biomass, but <clears throat> if we're really trying to deal with these pests, uh, it can help somewhat to reduce the, the amount of biomass that's out there. So we can either reduce the seeding rate, maybe cut rye seeding rate in half, or put some winter kill um, cover crops in the mix so that when we get into spring, it's a little thinner stand. And that will do a couple things. Most notably, it will help the predators be able to find the voles. Uh, so we also wanna protect the predators. You heard Ray talk about not hunting the coyotes. Let's keep them out there as part of our predators. We talk about raptors or owls, we can build perches. Uh, they can be quite inexpensive. Putting a few of those around the edge of the field, especially if there's no tree line can really help 
uh, with those populations, improving their uh, hunting ability in that field. It does pay to monitor for these, especially if they've shown up in the area in the past. So looking for those burrows and runs, uh, typically late winter or right after a snow is easiest. Um, helpful to look a week before planting. A general threshold is if you're seeing five burrows or more per acre, proceed to control that a little tough count because there are tunnels that are all over the place. So what are our options? Well, we could do some light soil disturbance and Ray is shuddering thinking about that and I am too. We prefer not to do that, but that may be the tool some people are gonna use. Um, we do have some other options uh, besides the things I've mentioned so far. Uh, we do see some use of uh, supplemental food. To, if you don't wanna do any poison or any tillage, you know, one option is to take some cracked corn out like four bushels of corn per acre, broadcast that and hope that they'll eat that corn rather than the corn we're trying to grow, or likewise with soybeans. Another option is to use a bait. Now, again, there's reasons not to do this uh, because it can influence and kill other vertebrates, but um, you know, maybe on a spot treatment basis where there's a particular concentration of them might be an option depending on you know, the goals of the system. Uh, these zinc phosphides, uh, they're not, again, a perfect solution, so this maybe would be a last resort. But on the other hand, the voles do provide some benefits. You heard Ray talk about these in terms of the food chain. They might eat some weed seeds. I certainly wouldn't rely on voles to eat all our weed seeds, but they can help some there, uh, consume some of the pest insects out there, and, and mainly they're just part of the food chain. And keep in mind, again, their populations are going to tend to cycle. So slugs are a very similar type of problem to, to voles in that they both like lots of cover. Now, the difference is that slugs are going to be worse in a cool, wet spring, whereas voles are not really going to be influenced by the temperature so much. If we have a hot, dry spring, we're unlikely to see problems with slugs. It's again going to be the cooler, wetter spring situations. There's a lot of different slugs in the U.S. The one that's most commonly a problem in Midwest row crops is the gray garden slug. So these, uh, they can lay eggs at different times of the year, but often they'll be laying them in the fall, and then they're going to be hatching in the middle of spring around May. Uh, and uh, it's the young juveniles that come out at that time that really tend to cause a big problem in our emerging cash crops. So this is a field in Virginia that was, you know, about 80% plus of it was wiped out, the field of soybeans by slugs. This is kind of a worst case scenario, very rare to see something this bad, but you can see a fair amount of damage from slugs. If it's corn, uh, they'll do some strip feeding on the leaves, as you can see these doing here, and the corn may tolerate that to some extent and eventually grow out of it. Um, here's some canola that's been badly damaged. Um, so they are they can certainly eat a lot of uh, foliage and on these emerging plants. And of course, the cover crops provide some additional cover for them and, and therefore can lead to increases in populations. But just like with voles, uh, if we can vary the species we're using, get some diversity out there, think about our termination timing, that can be factors. And you heard Ray allude earlier to not treating your seed with insecticides so that we have those natural populations of brown beetles. That's important, I'll come back to that. So with the cash crop, again, closing that seed slot, just like with voles, is really helpful. We don't want those slugs just kind of growing along in an open seed slot and eating on the seed. Again, planting deeper, um, trying to diversify our crop rotation can help. Now, a timing issue here with slugs, if we're in the Southern Corn Belt, we can maybe plant quite early and that allows the corn uh, and maybe even the soybeans to be up growing enough that they're, they've got good growth before the slugs emerge so that they can tolerate the slug activity. In the north, we might plant a little bit later than normal uh, so that the soil is nice and warm and we can get the corn growing fast so it can kind of outrun the slug damage, so to speak, or we can use some pop-up fertilizer to help it grow fast. If we're adjusting our cover crops, again, avoid mix. Now, in this case, I said radishes were helpful with voles, but with slugs, not so much. Um, they really like brassicas, it seems like, and radishes. So you know, if you're having a slug issue, maybe avoid brassicas in the mix. Uh, again, having a little thinner stand in the spring may be helpful. It can be a strategy. Uh, and 
the thing that we're kind of still researching, I wouldn't say it's proven that this is the way to go, but it seems like it can be helpful to plant green. Uh, the idea is the slugs keep eating the cover crop rather than moving on to that emerging cash crop. So if that cover crop is still alive, it provides a food source uh, and uh, that can be beneficial. And that the main thing though, is we want those predator insects. We want those ground beetles that can really help suppress the slug population, so as Ray said, avoiding neonicotinoids on the seed treatment can really be helpful. John Tooker at Penn State's done a lot of excellent research on that. I would encourage you to look at his information. So also minimizing insecticide spraying early in the season or really at other times uh, can be helpful as well. And then just getting enhanced habitat for these beneficial insects. Uh, you can do some monitoring. You can put out a, a board of some type, check it early in the morning. Uh, you can also go out at night with a flashlight or again, very early in the morning to see what kind of damage is looking for. On those corn, you're gonna see those strip feeding on the leaves. Soybeans, they may chew a hole through the cod leading or nibble on the edge of the leaves. Um, and really the key time is early because once that crop gets bigger and more vigorously growing, not so much of an issue. Again, we'd prefer not to do any disturbance, but this is an option to help knock back a really severe population. Um, there are other options. We can look at toxic baits. These are kind of expensive and they don't always work very well. They're, um, if it rains on them, that can reduce their effectiveness too, but it is something that could be used in spot treatments. If we're gonna do that, we put it on in the evening, right before the slug activity at night. Uh, but again, try to avoid doing it before a rain. So slugs and voles are two of the issues you hear most about, but there are other pests that can be a factor in cover crop situations. Wireworms are an occasional issue. I don't hear a lot about this, but they certainly can be an issue. Sometimes if we come out of a grass sod field, uh, like a hay field and put it into corn, we'll see wireworms. So um, if lately we've been hearing a little bit more about army worms as an occasional pest in cover crop fields, so part of it is thinking about the cash crop and cover crop rotation. If we're using a legume before a legume, sometimes we'll get certain pests, or if we've got uh, grasses like cereal rye before corn, that may worsen a situation with armyworm or wireworm. So again, diversity is always a good strategy to avoid some of these issues. And that's gonna help with our beneficial insects, which are key to helping reduce some of these pest populations. So last thing I wanted to touch on is just kind of this green bridge. I would, I would first say, we don't fully understand this. Uh, every year we're learning more about this. There's a, a big large scale study going on with several universities right now to try to better understand how diseases and insects are influenced by planting green and whether a green bridge is a good or bad thing. I think the story in the end is gonna be for some pests, it's helpful to keep that cover crop growing as long as possible. And maybe for a few pests, not as helpful, but overall, I think we're starting to see that there are benefits to doing it. So the idea is that if you keep that cover crop alive and green until the cash crop keeps growing, maybe certain pests are just moving right from that cover crop into the cash crop. Now, again, that's just a hypothesis. So the thinking in the past, and by past, I mean like two or three years ago was, well, just go out and terminate early, you know, terminate two or three weeks early. And indeed, that can be a s approach that may be helpful in some situations. A kind of a newer line of thinking, but again, we need more research on this, is that if we can keep that cover crop growing long enough, the, the pest will feed on the cover crop uh, if it's an insect and not attack as much that emerging cash crop, or if it's a, a disease pathogen, uh, if the cover crop is not decaying and dying, then it's maybe that's not going to splash onto our emerging corn seedling. The corn will get big enough by the time the cover crop dies to not be an issue. So I think the bottom line is, as we get into these fields, we need to experiment a little bit more. But my general personal feeling is that we're going to see more benefits to the planting green than, than there are problems with it. So to summarize, um, you know, voles and slugs are certainly more likely to be an issue in high residue situations. If we can make adjustments to both the cash crop management and cover crop, we can, we can help reduce these problems, maybe not eliminate them entirely. Encourage predators, whether it's um, wildlife that's gonna go after the voles or beneficial insects that'll help attack the slugs, that's gonna help us a great deal. Termination timing's gonna factor in, doing just like any pests doing some regular scouting can help. So there's some things we can definitely do. No, 
silver bullets, but if we take kind of a shotgun approach uh, to using a combination of strategies, we can deal with these challenging situations. So thanks, that was a quick tour of some pest issues, but um, I guess we have a few minutes for questions for, for Ray or myself, so thank you. Um, do either of you think um, maybe planting your cash crop a little later when it's it's warmer out maybe helps the crop outgrow the slug population if that's a concern? Ray, have you ever experienced slugs? No, <clears throat> no, I have not. So a lot of people do in my area. There's something about the way I farm that and I think it's, you know, I've heard that where they've used insecticide and not used insecticide treated uh, soybeans, that the slugs did way more damage on the treated side of the field. And when they switched to untreated soybeans, that there was far less damage. So maybe that's one of the, the keys to why I've never had much slug damage, but certainly voles, have, you know, they're, they can be troublesome. And we just simply go back in and plant. What we do is we map the bowl holes as we're spraying. And then we have a map that we can overlay in the tractor and we go out with a small planter and replant all the bowl holes. And, and they will make soybeans when planted later. So Sort of what we're doing is planting soybeans very early and moving corn planting way back. And our yields have went up by doing so. So late planted corn can outrun a lot of these uh, problems that you can, can have under cold, wet conditions. So we're moving to planting corn later and soybeans earlier. So that's one of the solutions we're kind of have landed on, but it's taken a lot of years to try to figure this out. Looks like there's a couple more questions for Ray in the chat. So one of the questions there is about will there be further meetings on terminating and that is, especially in my situation, uh, that's a very, uh, you got to have a lot of skills and knowledge to do it because I use a lot of annual ryegrass and annual ryegrass will have a, a four foot root system. It's great for breaking up your soils and sequestering carbon, but you can imagine a two foot tall plant with a four foot root system uh, doesn't want to die. So planting green, especially like where I'm non-GMO corn, uh, you have to burn that down properly. So you need a good knowledge on balancing the water pH, only spraying, you know, during the warm periods of the day and not close to dark and, and things like that. But last year we actually planted soybeans into our cover crops and it got wet and cold and we didn't even spray them. We didn't even spray the cover crop until post-emergent spraying the beans. Corn hates cover crop that's green when it comes up. Soybeans love cover crops. So you got to treat each different on termination because you certainly don't want anything green, green going and growing and competing with corn. It, it, it will not respond well to that. But soybeans seem to very, be very tolerant of green planting and so forth. Ray, somebody asked if you use any compost extract or just straight compost on any of your land. Is that something you've tried? No, I have not. But again, if you're growing three to six ton of biomass on top of the ground, you're letting the biology do that for you. And of course, earthworms work very hard and work cheap. So, you know, the compost that I'm creating is, is, being grown from the carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere and with the energy of the sun. So, you know, my goal is, is to have lots of biomass on the ground. So I don't like to have it where when I'm harvesting corn, you can't see any of the biomass left. I think I'm starving the soil. So you know, though I have a tremendous amount of biomass in the spring and you say, you know, how you can even plant through this, 
with a healthy soil, uh, you're concerned in the fall because it's all gone. It's all been converted into the soil. So I'd look at things maybe different than a lot of farmers, but I'm, I want to feed those two elephants and not starve them any part of the year. There's a question from William Gibson about uh, predatory insects. So I'll take that one. Um, obviously, there's a very wide range of predatory insects, some of which are generalists that feed on a lot of prey insects, some of them are more targeted. We were both, uh, Ray and I mentioned ground beetles as being a critical one um, early in the season, particularly for slugs, but they'll also help with certain other things. They can, for example, feed on younger army worms. Um, so ground beetles, unfortunately, are one of the insects that's quite affected by having seed that has neonicotinoid treatments, which most much of our corn seed has on it. And so uh, if a farmer is experiencing some problems with slugs, they might think about uh, obtaining corn seed that does not have that neonicotinoid treatment on it. Uh, so that they can build up their populations of ground beetles. Now, it might take a couple of years, but John Tooker at Penn State University is an entomologist that's done a large amount of research on this, and he's quite convinced that if we have good amounts of ground beetles in our field, that that can really help reduce the, the slug problem, and I think Ray was alluding to that with his own experience. Yeah, and Purdue's done some research, a lot of research on neonicotinoids and Others that I've seen present, you know, somewhere between 10 and 20 percent of it only ends up in any part of the corn plant. So most of it is highly water soluble and getting off into the soil profile. And, uh, you know, when you're paying for something, you're getting very little use of in the plant. I, I think farmers who are trying to move to a healthy soil should slowly convert over to not using neonicotinoids if they can. There's a question about planting a diverse habitat in, in what would normally be a grassed waterway. Um, Ray, you've alluded to trying to allow some of those diverse plant species to come in. I don't know of any extensive um, like university research on having diverse waterway species. There's probably some out there, but probably the work that would be somewhat relevant is at Iowa State University, they have the strips research, which is more on planting diverse natives on uh, contour strips across the field rather than in waterways, but they've shown a huge number of benefits that are well documented for both reducing loss of nutrients and soil and uh, herbicides from fields, as well as benefits for pollinators and wildlife. So that the Iowa strips research would be something to look at. But Ray, what are your thoughts on that, uh, having diverse plant species and waterways? Well, we're lucky in our county, we have a native plant specialist, an invasive species specialist, and certainly being able to identify the native plants that are beneficial versus invasive plants it was the initial struggle for me. So I would take pictures with my phone and say, I see a lot of this coming in my roadside or my grass waterway. And if it was identified as a very beneficial plant, then I certainly wouldn't spray it. So I got a lot of just uh, populations from not mowing or not spraying everything in that grass waterway. Uh, in the one grass waterway that's got the best, we had planted native stuff on the edge of the grass waterway and fescue down the middle. Well, now the whole grass waterway is, is popular. And, and things like green briars that people will say, I don't want briars in there, very beneficial to wildlife. So, you know, there's all kinds of plants that want to grow in your roadside, in your ditch, in there. So being able to identify uh, and, and a lot of times you can get books on, on invasive species. So if you got poison hemlock, you certainly want to knock it back. And so if you've got a beneficial butterfly weed growing in your grass waterway or milkweed is a good example, everyone can identify milkweeds. So don't spray your milkweeds, let them shed their seed across your ditches and so forth. And pretty soon you got milkweed everywhere and you're helping monarch butterflies and nature's Nature's doing that for you by just not worrying about you got milkweed growing along the road, but I need to mow it all down. Go around that patch, you know, or if you mow it, let the new ones come up and be green 
uh, habitat for monarchs later in the summer. And, and then I've got a lot of river bottoms. So one thing I've observed is a lot of pollinators go into these wet river bottom areas in late summer, whereas a lot of plants are blooming and flourishing then. And my pollinator habitat up on the hills is all dried up. So low lying areas can be very beneficial in, in late season for a lot of pollinators butterflies and so forth. So, you know, that's just something I've observed. So I, I try to, you know, modify what I do depending on what's going to be beneficial for them. And there was a question earlier from Tony about um, having high biomass at termination time versus um, terminating a little earlier. Um, Again, we're seeing more farmers as they get experience with cover crops doing this idea of planting green where they're letting the cover crop grow until they're planting the cash crop. And we seem to see a lot of benefits both for managing soil moisture, helping reduce weed populations, improving the soil biology, soil carbon, and some of these pollinator benefits that we've talked about this morning. But at the same time, for a new user of cover crops, they may not be comfortable with having four or five foot tall cereal rye that they're planting soybeans into. So I think the key thing is if we can keep that cover crop growing through the winter and maybe the first year or two they're using the cover crop. Yeah, they might terminate it two or three weeks ahead of time, but they've still had a living root most of the year. That's the number one thing we want to achieve. And then as they get some comfort and experience, they can let that cover crop grow longer and start to realize some of the benefits. Now, I will say we don't necessarily need a lot of difference in our equipment uh, to plant green. It's surprising that um, most of our newer planters can handle that pretty well. Um, in fact, some of the old thinking that you needed all these special devices like trash clears and so on may not apply, especially if we're planting into a standing cover crop. And I'm sure Ray could elaborate on his experience, but those are just a few general points on the uh, idea of planting green versus earlier termination. Yeah, that's, that is very well put. Uh, planting green can be easier getting the seed into the ground, but the term, termination of the cover crop is much more tricky. So as Rob said, uh, until you've got some experience, uh, you're stepping up to the pro level or the advanced level of no tilling and cover crops when you start working with planting into green and soybeans are very forgiving. Corn is not. So, you know, if you want to start moving into planting green, I would advise you to do it with drilling into these bigger cover crops because termination of grasses is much easier than soybeans than it is corn. If you don't get a complete kill populations and and the uh, consistency of population and depth isn't nearly as critical in soybeans as it is in corn. So Rob, Rob hit the nail right on the head. So just be careful moving into planting green and, and do it first with soybeans. Rob, I got a question. Sure. So are, are you looking any at stink bugs? I mean, I'm proud of what I'm doing, but stink bugs are the one thing that I will spray. I, they can really damage the pods on my soybeans and they're crawling around on me and my desk here during this meeting. Are, are stink bugs taking over the world or what's going on? Well, I'll I, so I'm an agronomist, not an entomologist, but one of our entomologists here at University of Missouri, Kevin Rice, he's regularly posting about marmorated stink bugs and all the additional stink bug problems we're seeing. So we are seeing more issues with them. Um, they can be attacked by some beneficial insects at their early growth stages. Once they're mature, there are far fewer things that will kill them, but there are some assassin beetles and other things that will take them out even as adults. So. It's just like anything, if we can support a diverse population of predators, that's going to help us. But there's no question that's one of our emerging threats with our cash crops, for sure. And non-native invasive. A lot of them are non-native, yep. I really appreciate you guys being on today, and um, I think we had some great discussion. So thanks again. Thanks for having me. You're welcome. Thanks. Thanks.